morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. At this time, I would like to call to order the External Relations Committee meeting for Thursday, July 22nd, 2021. May I have everyone sign in, please? Thank you. So are there any changes or additions to the agenda for today? Any changes or additions to the agenda for today? Hearing none, may I have a motion for the approval of the May 20th, 2021 External Relations Committee meeting minutes? Second. Ask everyone to vote. Thank you. At this time, we will have a briefing from the Chief of Staff, Melissa Mullinax, regarding the external affairs, outreach, and public engagement efforts an update. Thank you, Ms. Mullinex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is this close enough to me? Everyone out there can hear okay? Can you guys hear okay? Can you hear? Yeah. Speak up, get, get closer. Up. Okay. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Parker. I'm going to give you guys a quick briefing on um, the public engagement work that we've been engaged in recently around More Marta Atlanta. I want to just say on the front end that this is uh, not uh, to say that we haven't been doing public engagement around projects in Fulton and Clayton and DeKalb, uh, but we have in June, May, June, July, been very involved with the More Marta Atlanta projects, and I want to give you guys a brief update on those. First, we're going to talk about Campbellton Road, which we're still in the middle of, with the Streetcar East extension, which we finished phase one of public engagement, uh, an update on the Summerhill BRT project. Uh, a quick mention about what's coming for the five points transformation and then lastly a summary of the um, rail car internal now I'm sorry how do I change the slide I don't actually oh we still have to say that okay all right so uh, here you see the Campbellton corridor with the with the map of the project we began the the planning uh, in the fall of 2019 with a study to determine whether uh, this should be a bus rapid transit project or a light rail project as it was originally slated when it came to us from the city of Atlanta in their 2016 project list. Uh, this is along Campbellton Road um, from Oakland City Station down to Greenbrier. It's Route 83, the second busiest of all of our market bus routes. Um, six miles. The, the proposed um, alignment, regardless of mode, is uh, nine stations with two options for Greenbrier. Um, what will happen next for the board on this is that planning department um, much later this year will come back with a full briefing on the public engagement but also their planning studies and charrettes that we'll, we'll be doing internally um, and the board will have to take a vote on the locally preferred alternative. Um, as you can see on the next slide, uh, we started this in person, of course, in 2019, and then have gone to virtual in uh, June of 2020 and 2021. We've had a really sort of a long-term engagement on this project. Um, we've been talking, of course, with the developers along that area, Invest Atlanta, the three members of city council whose districts uh, this touches, which would be Marcy Overstreet, Cleta Winslow, and Joyce Shepard. Um, and we next week we'll be, we'll be holding three pop-up meetings at Fort Mac. Um, after we have canvassed each of the businesses along the route so that everybody really understands what's coming. 
you know, the, the days, I think these projects are going to be such big construction projects that the days of sort of posting online that we're having a meeting and, and letting people respond who, who see that really isn't going to cut it anymore. And so we've been actually canvassing the businesses to make sure they're aware of what's coming and to get their, their opinion on it. So next slide, please. You'll see also that we've been using paper surveys. So for we've been having people ride the buses um, and actually solicit people's opinion on the bus on, on 83. Um, we've had over a thousand unique visitors to the virtual meeting room. And I think in, in the end, um, you'll, you'll see a really detailed report out from the planning department and a decision to be made about light rail um, on bus rapid transit. Um, you'll see also the, the pictures there are pictures from, the, uh, from Twitter where we've had really a lot of, a lot of engagement uh, around that. Next slide, please. So this is the Streetcar East extension. Um, this is the light rail project that would run from Edgewood uh, up to the Beltline. Um, if you know that, you can see the map here, but what so, sort of more detailed, this, this would come up Edgewood and it would turn left onto Randolph and then right onto Auburn to get over to Irwin and the Crock Street Market area. And then it would uh, track alongside the Beltline up to Pont City Market. Um, again, with this project, when it comes up Edgewood and turns left onto Randolph, it gets into a residential neighborhood. So we canvassed, went to each house um, that would be impacted to make sure that they were aware of the, of the meetings and had all the materials, and we've gotten significant amount of feedback from, from folks. Next slide, please. Um, you'll see that in our virtual meeting room that we had in May, we had uh, in the virtual meeting, um, the public meeting, it was two, over 260 attendees, um, more than 500 survey responses. Um, and before we did the public meeting, we did a series of small stakeholder meetings with different groups. It was the developers along the area, um, along the Edgewood route and along the Beltline, um, the Old Fourth Ward and the Central Line of Progress, sort of the neighborhood, the, the business groups, um, the King Center and the National Park Service. So we're really trying to make sure that um, folks are touched and are aware of what's coming. Um, I'll, I'll share that what we've heard a lot of is concern about the Edgewood Business District congestion there. Um, you all may know that the city has decided to close that the section of Edgewood from where the streetcar ends at, at Jackson right now up to Boulevard every every weekend. Um, and so we're coordinating closely with the city on this construction project and sort of planning around what what uh, transportation looks like in that part of the city going forward. It is very congested um, and will likely just get more congested. So let's go to the next slide, which is Summerhill BRT. So I, you, I think most of you all have seen this, uh, the corridor map for Summer Hill. Um, it shows uh, the alignment going up Capitol, AKA Hank Aaron, um, and turning left to go down through the government center at five points and then circling back. Uh, that's, the, uh, that's the alignment that we're working with and we have continued to do, ha have the conversations uh, with folks around five points, the developers there. Uh, and how we manage buses in, in, in downtown. Um, and then most recently, just last week, planning led a station visioning workshop, two workshops um, to get folks' input on the, on the shelters and what all the, what all the amenities will be at the shelters, which will be different, of course, for the, for the BRT stops than what we have currently. Next slide, please. And we'll... So this just is a summary of what we've done so far on Summer Hill, which is over 350 attendees um, last, last year. Um, and then recently, of course, with, this, with the visioning workshops, those were in, in person in our building last week, two different days. Um, and then we will go back out into um, in-person in meetings in the fall of this year. Next slide, please. So on five points, you remember that you that the board recently voted to issue the um, the contract to sk um, Skidmore Owings, and so that will kick off in earnest um, after Labor Day. But I wanted to point this out to you because we've been doing, of course, the station rehab work on five points, um, and 
with Summer Hill coming into Five Points, there's been lots of conversation around Five Points and what, what that looks like. Um, so, and of course, the, the, the timing is, is tight with the focus on the 2026 World Cup. So even though we just did the, the, the contract for the, for the planning team, we've been having conversations with folks at Five Points and very focused on what that's going to look like. Last slide is a summary for you guys of the rail car um, preliminary design outreach. So really, we're, we're really proud of the number of people that, uh, number of votes that we got on this. Um, I think people are excited about the new rail cars and are uh, appreciative of the opportunity to weigh in and share their opinions on it. What comes next on rail car um, is engagement around the exterior options and what it looks like. So I know we're all eager to see that. We'll bring that to the board and then we'll take that out to the public. And that is my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Are there any questions Let's, for Ms. Polinax? Yeah. What, uh, you have a very complex number of planning jobs going, but, and some of these are partially funded, some of them are totally funded, but of the three projects you highlighted, what are the funding obstacles in the way to get something built? Well, that's a Jeff question. Maybe, that, huh? that, that. Um, so, you know, all of these projects are funded through, um, you know, the local funding is through the half cent sales tax right. that, that the city raised and um, the quarter projects uh, typically are, are, we are going to go after federal funds through the CIG program. So Campbellton Road um, in the in the cadre of projects that Melissa just presented, Campbellton Road clearly needs to be successful in getting funds through the CIG program. Now, it's one of our busier corridors. It's relatively dense, and we, you know, are are hopeful that Congress is going to act on a larger program, and so there should be more funds available. So we feel you know, confident that, that we will uh, be successful in getting federal funds for that. The, the, the uh, extension of the streetcar, which is a relatively smaller project, we've made a decision um, to forego pursuing federal funds for that project. Um, it's relatively short. Um, we don't know, sort of question the success of a shorter corridor, getting federal funds, and it's a project that's ready to go, so we want to move it forward. So that's fully funded with local funds. And then um, the, the, the other project, Five Points, not eligible, a station rehabilitation like that is not eligible for the CIG program, and that will be fully funded with uh, local funds. Although we will try and get some dis other discretionary programs to help fund that, uh, possibly state dollars, but those but that uh, any of that funding source would either allow us to enhance the project um, or um, reduce the local funds and you know allow us to have flexibility on, on other projects. And if you think about the more MARTA program, we've got a we've got a 40 year investment plan. So money that we can capture from the feds or from the state can be leveraged in years to come for just the risks of a pro program of that of that size to make sure that we can deliver everything we've committed to. So okay. pretty, pretty low risk on, on, on the three projects that we've just talked about. And Summer Hill, that's funny. I'm sorry, Summer Hill, yeah, Summer Hill is, uh, we, we already have the, uh, the funding from, um, from we, we were, you know, working with the city, we got what was a, a Tiger Grant um, uh, back, what, in 2017. Um, so we already have a grant agreement with the FTA and, you know, we're, we're ready to draw down some of that money and we have the local funds through the more MARTA half cent sales tax to, to, to fund that in its entirety. So there's really no risk in terms of funding with that project. So for three of these, there are no funding barriers. It's just a matter of going through the planning, the environmental yes. and yes. start construction. Right. I have a question. I received a couple of calls from city council members uh, 
that received calls from citizens concerned about the pop-up meetings location at Fort McPherson, mm -hmm. having to walk quite a distance and thinking it would have been more advantageous to have the meetings at a location that was more accessible for those mm -hmm. that use public transit. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? Oh, or we, we have heard that. Um, and I, a couple of things. One is, and we've responded to those, to those council members and to the, um, our, our friend Sherry, uh, who raised the, the issue. Um, this is the, the pop-ups next week are just the, the last portion of the public outreach. We've had four or five other meetings in other locations. Um, and the, the bus stop is less than a quarter mile away. So that, that's not a, not a mile. Okay. No. So I, that, that's a pretty short walk. We, we looked into having, um, after we heard this concern, having shuttle from Oakland City Station to the location. But honestly, that the pop-ups are all day, right? We're going to have staff there so that people can come at their convenience from nine to five, three days. It's just unreasonable to have bus shuttles running, you know. So was there a consideration for or were other locations contacted that may have been? Yeah, yeah we did. and. Um, because a couple of things, we needed a large enough space to allow still for social distancing, and some of the churches that that were mentioned as possible locations um, weren't weren't open for us to to use right now. Um, so it's certainly a valid concern. I'll say that I think our public engagement team does a really good job of being present about location and um, transit accessibility. Um, in this instance, I think we've we hit the best mark that we could knowing that this is not the only time that people have had a chance to weigh in. And we can, we can, uh, Council Member Overstreet offered to do additional meetings into the, into the fall at other locations as, as we have a chance, more places are open and willing to accommodate a group again. Um, and we can also do another online virtual meeting. Um, I think this is, uh, I think that the planning likely comes back to the board in November or December. We have, we have a lot of time. So we are in constant conversation with Councilwoman Overstreet. Oh yeah, thank you. I want to make sure. Yep. And, and we're doing an, we're doing an event next week with um, Councilwoman um, Cleve Winslow. So, yeah. thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, along the same lines, Melissa, I received um, an email. I don't know if all of the board members got this email or not from Sherry Williams. Did you all get that? I think it's because I'm in a community group, um, but I did want to read it um, into the record, if I may. Um, it's short. It says, hi, Marta Hamilton BRT LRT pop-up meeting for three days is at Fort Mac. How insensitive. Residents are hot. H-O-T capital, exclamation mark. Why people have to transfer from number 83 bus to another bus or train for Fort Mac and walk a mile from the gate to the building? Only people with the car have real easy access to this meeting. Why not have these pop-up days at locations along the 83 bus route? All three have big parking lots in case you want to do tent instead of being in the building. Uh, the location suggested was the Young YMCA uh, Mount Carmel uh, Missionary Baptist Church, Greenbrier Mall, and St. Mark AME Church. I'm familiar with all of those locations. Um, I think that would be uh, preferable. It says, please contact Marta to ask them what is going on. So the thing that I want to say is that if you can't get there, you can't get there. I don't care how many you have. If you can't get to it, you can't get to it. Um, and then along the line of virtual, everybody doesn't have access. I mean, so we need to probably put a little bit more consideration into things like that. You know, just understand, everybody is not at the same level. Uh, seems like a lot of people have had feedback on this, and I think that it might be worth doing one more in one of those locations that was suggested. I know that the Y can accommodate. I know that Mount Carmel is open and it has huge space. 
um, Greenbrier Mall, I mean, it's just a big open atrium. Uh, there, there is a possibility for doing something along bus route 83 because that's who's going to concern the most. So that's, that's what I wanted to say on that. Um, I have a question. I, I know this is not about all the other uh, projects, but my question is who's actually working community outreach for Clayton County now? Who's working? So John McKinley and Tony Thornton are still in the community engagement team. Um, and the, we have two different subs for Clayton Community Engagement, which is um, the collaborative firm through Michael Hightower, and um, I believe it's Content Terry is the sub to AECOM. So they're doing community outreach? They are. And you'll have a briefing on that when? We'll have to look at the calendar and schedule it. We're, we're going to begin the conversation around Clayton Commuter, which we've talked about some with the board members. Um, okay. I'd like to meet John McKinley. Okay. I'd like to meet John McKinley. Never heard his name before. Okay. He's been on staff here for over a year. But let, let me speak Where did Virgil Flood? He's not still doing it? Virgil Flood is a contractor right now working on a very specific project. No, he hasn't been for since last July. Yeah. Virgil was the AGM of External Affairs. He, he was over the department, but he wasn't doing community outreach. Okay, but he was coordinating a lot of the community outreach, mm -hmm. at least with me. Now I have no contact. So what, so what we'll do is, once we finish with the briefing under other matters, we'll bring that up okay. based upon the agenda. So we'll go back to that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. On, on, the, on the Campbellton Road engagement, I, if I didn't make that, this point clear in the presentation, let me say it now, which is that we know uh, that people can't always get to any location, no matter where it is. And so we have had teams on the buses and at the bus stops doing engagement, which is, um, I think, a new thing for MARTA, um, and have had tremendous success with that. So we're bring, bringing it directly to them. Anybody who wants to give an opinion on this project has had multiple opportunities to, and will continue to do that. We're also working right now with Greenbrier to have a location there um, in light of um, Sherry's email. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions for Ms. Mullinax regarding this presentation? Hearing none, thank you, Ms. Mullinax. At this time, we have a briefing regarding media impressions for March through June 2021. Stephanie Fisher, Manager of Communications. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Well, good morning, Madam Chair, Mr. Parker, Ms. Mullinax, and committee members. It's a pleasure to see you in person again and to come before you to provide an overview of our media impressions for March through June. Next slide, please. In March, we released eight press releases. Some of the highlights, the Georgia legislature passed House Bill 511, we achieved APTA's gold status for our sustainability commitment program. We partnered with the state of Georgia and Delta to provide transportation to and from the COVID vaccination site at the airport. And we announced a partnership with the Asian American Foundation to stop Asian hate in the wake of the spa shootings here in Atlanta. Next slide. That partnership resulted in a strong system-wide campaign that you can see here. This is from our marketing department and it led to some positive news coverage as well. Of the 597 news stories in March, in which MARTA was mentioned, 83% were positive or neutral in tone. There were three incidents on the system that resulted in a higher amount of negative news coverage for the month, including a bus accident in Clayton County and a shooting on the train at HE Home Station. The news coverage in March had an advertising value equivalent of $8 million. Next slide, please. In April, we sent eight press releases. Two of them were announcing the restoration of our bus routes that we had suspended in April 2020 due to COVID. We distributed an electronic press kit that included video and photos of all of the additional safety measures that are in place on our buses. And the electronic press kit included interviews with our frontline MARTA employees. We announced the sale of land near College Park Station to the Finding the Flint Conservation Fund. 
We provided a one-time pandemic payment to frontline and represented employees, and we distributed an electronic press kit and press release announcing the authorization for a Beltline Transit Engineering Study. Next slide. MARTA held a media availability on the Beltline to give reporters a better understanding of the areas that are in need of further study before any transit can be built. Here you can see Larry Prescott talking to CBS 46. Heather Aladeff and Grady Smith with VHB also gave interviews. There were 432 news stories in April in which MARTA was mentioned, and almost all of them registered as positive or neutral in tone. And I think that's quite a feat when you're discussing Beltline Transit. The restoration of bus routes, though, garnered the most coverage for the month, boosting the advertising value equivalent to $6 million. May was a busy month. If we can go to the next slide, it had public meetings and hearings. We had the budget, the streetcar east extension, and new rail cars being discussed. Here you can see Mr. Parker being interviewed by Fox 5 about how riders can give their input on the new rail car design. The details of all those public meetings, many of which Melissa mentioned, were among the 11 press releases we distributed in May. We also announced the sale of land to Columbia Residential to develop senior affordable housing near Avondale Station, and we applauded Governor Kemp signing the state budget with its first ever line item from MARTA. Next slide. MARTA was mentioned in the news a lot in May, 888 times, and a lot of that was because of Secretary Pete's visit to Atlanta and his tour of MARTA with Mr. Parker, Congresswoman Williams, and Senator Ossoff. The news coverage in May was mostly positive or neutral in tone, and it has resulted in the largest advertising value equivalent of the year at $12 million. The over 20% of negative news coverage in May came from shootings at College Park and Five Point Station and a bus accident that happened in Clayton County. Next slide. In June, we sent out a record 16 press releases, with several of them announcing projects spearheaded by MARTA's public art program, Artbound. Artbound worked with an artist and historian to transform Grant Street Tunnel, and we're holding a community and press event there tomorrow to celebrate Reflection Tunnel, which you can see here. MARTA adopted a balanced budget yet again for a 10th consecutive year. We partnered with Goldman Sachs for a $100 million affordable housing and TOD initiative, with special consideration given to women developers of color. And Artbound teamed up with the Perimeter Community Improvement Districts to install a mural and lighting and safety upgrades at Dunwoody Station. Next slide. Mr. Parker joined Board Chair Scott and Board Member Hardage, along with Dunwoody Mayor Lynn Deutsch and artist Nika King at Dunwoody to celebrate those improvements. The PCID has also hired a production crew to get some photos, video, and interviews, and then we were able to share that content with any media outlets that were unable to join us at the event. There were 588 news stories in June in which MARTA was mentioned, resulting in an advertising value equivalent of $6 million. 91% of the stories in the month registered as positive or neutral in tone. And another highlight I want to mention was being featured in Atlanta Magazine, our bus network redesign. And that article had an interview with Mr. Parker and Mr. Greenwood. Next slide. Other stories of note in June, the Atlanta Bicycle Coalition recognized our frontline employees with the Essential Transit Award. And the MARTA Board, as you know, approved a firm to oversee the transformation of Five Points Station. The news coverage over the last four months has started to move away from COVID. And now that we're safely able to hold news conferences and ribbon cuttings again, I feel like things are starting to return to normal a bit. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Are there Thank any you. questions for Ms. Fisher? Are there any questions for Ms. Fisher? Hearing none? Thank you. Other matters. Ms. Abdul Salam, did you want to continue your question? No, I, I was finished. You're finished? Okay, thank you. Any other matters to come before the External Relations Committee? Madam Chair, if I could just uh, remind folks, you, you all got the invitation for the Grant Street ribbon cutting tomorrow, the, the reflection tunnel that Stephanie mentioned. Um, I know at least one board member will be joining us. It begins at 12. Um, it will go until 2, but we'll start the program around 12.15. So if you can join, that would be terrific. 
Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Mr. Pond? I'm sorry, Ms. Hardage is here. Hi, Ms. Hardage. Are we ready to start with the audit committee? I don't think we lost anybody, so good. Hi. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to call the audit committee to order. And the first thing on the agenda is our roll call. Can everyone please sign in? What, how, do I just hit this to sign in? Like, yes? Okay. Didn't do it. None of us are doing it, I wonder. We're trying to sign in. We are. They're not working. Yeah, my, mine's not working either. Let's try again. That worked.
So do we have everybody? Okay. I now need a motion to approve the minutes of the May 20th Audit Committee. So moved. Mr. Pond, do I have a second? Mr. Worthy seconds. So we now need to vote on the minutes. Ms. Blakely. Okay. Can we see the results just to make sure? Thank you. The first item on the agenda is a resolution authorizing the solicitation of proposals for the procurement of external audit services for MARTA's annual financial audits for fiscal years 2023 through 2027. And we are fortunate to have a meal with us today. So good to see you in person. Likewise, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Hardich, uh, Mr. Parker, members of the MARTA board, good morning. I would like to uh, respectfully request approval of the resolution to issue a RFP request for proposal for the procurement of external audit uh, services for MARTA for fiscal years 23 to 27. Every five years, the authority issues an RFP in order to select an external audit firm to conduct MARTA's external audits and all related audit work. Uh, the current audit firm will conduct uh, the current fiscal year uh, annual audit and also the annual audit of fiscal year 22. However, beginning in uh, fiscal year 23, we need to appoint or reappoint uh, an, an external audit firm. So today I'm asking for your approval and subsequent the board approval just to issue a request for proposal so we can uh, go to the street and select the best audit firm for MARTA. Uh, we have approximately a year, according to the MARTA Act, we need to have an agreement signed by July 31st, 2022. Um, we'll uh, have a year to go through the process and select the best possible firm. Once we have made a selection, we'll come back to the audit committee and the board and ask for approval of that selection. This is just an approval for RFP. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, move for approval first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Palm. Second. So we have we have the motion and the second. Now, do we have any questions? I, I do have one. Mr. Palm. Mia, we talked about this uh, before the meeting. Uh, sometimes there is some, you, you put the RFP out, you make the best decision for the best value for art. I, I just sometimes wonder after Crow has had this for what? five years now? Correct. I sometimes wonder from a value standpoint, just having a totally fresh set of eyes uh, at a certain point in time, you're not better served. I'm not sure you could eliminate them, but I know from my experience in business, sometimes when you get a uh, someone coming in, particularly in something like an audit, having a totally different set of eyes sometimes has some benefits, sometimes it doesn't. I'm just not saying that you drive the selection. I'm just putting that out as a thought process for your team? Uh, Mr. Pont, I believe the proponents, and we had a lot last time, I believe we had eight proponents in the last RFP. They'll have the opportunity to present their value proposition along with the price. The MARTA Act uh, is uh, pretty specific in the way we need to select the external audit firm. We'll certainly comply with the Act and other value proposition elements, but uh, I acknowledge and I accept your feedback, and I think uh, um, th there's value in a different set of eyes, for sure, along with many other dimensions in that process, but I appreciate the feedback and I accept it. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Oh, Ms. <laughs> Abdul Salam. Thank you. Uh, Emil, does this um, RFP, does it have a, a DBE goal? Yes, Ms. Abdul Salam, it does have a DBE goal. Our current vendor has a 20% DBE participation. 
I have personally worked with members of auditors uh, from the DBE firm, so firsthand I know that they're there and they do real work. Uh, we will continue to have a, DAB, uh, a, a DBA goal in, in this RFP. Uh, Paul is already engaged, but you have my commitment that this will, be, this will continue to be part of that request for proposal because we have, uh, we have an opportunity to do that in a meaningful way. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Mr. Floyd? Yeah, just a quick, is there an approval process to present a response to this? I mean, do you, I mean, is there any kind of pre-requirement? And, and uh, along the same lines that Roberta's asking, you know, are there firms that are, are there firms that would not be allowed to bid this because of certain restrictions or? What are the qualifications? And I've asked 10 questions and none of them made sense to me, to me but uh, what are the qualifications to, to do this? Are there a list of those qualifications? So the MARTA Act specifically, and I'll maybe turn it over to Liz for more detailed answer, but the MARTA Act requires the audit firm to be licensed to practice in the state of Georgia, to be qualified and to be experienced in public sector auditing. Um, and um, we will have a number of uh, qualification requirements in the RFP. Those firms uh, which meet those qualification requirements will be, will be considered. Um, so we don't have any disqualification requirements, if you will. Any firm that's licensed to practice in the state of Georgia can submit a proposal, but they certainly have to be qualified to audit a large public body uh, such as MARTA and their experience in the transit industry is very, very important. We're receiving a significant amount of grants. We have, um, we're subject to significant oversight by the FTA. There are other audit work that has to be done on our uh, NTD or National Transit Database reporting. We cannot afford to select a firm that does not have experience in auditing public transit uh, bodies such as MARTA with the complexity that we have. So we do have a list of qualification requirements that, that are important for the quality audit work uh, that has to be produced. Audit is one of those things that you, you don't get a second chance. You have to have a good audit by the deadline uh, and you need to file it with the FTA, et cetera. So, so that's a long answer to, to a simple question, which is as long as the audit firms meet our qualification requirements, we will review them. And as I mentioned the last time, there were eight proponents that we reviewed. And, and these consultants, the sub-consultants, the minority participation that you've talked about, do you do any kind of interest? I mean, I, there are a couple of firms that I'm thinking of, really, that would obviously not qualify in my mind, to do the audit, but they might qualify to do parts of it. And they don't know anything about, I mean, they would not respond to the MARTA proposal, but they might respond to, if they knew it was going on, they might send a letter of interest to the people they knew might respond to it. Do, do you do anything like trying to drive some interest from minority or smaller firms, if you will, to participate in this in some way? Is there, have you ever done that? So, uh, if I may, I, I'm, part of what procurement will do when they get ready to issue this RFP is to put that kind of notice out to um, a variety of firms, and we also encourage some of the larger um, auditing accounting firms that have been the ones to respond in the past to um, partner with some of the smaller entities that might be the DBEs that would be involved in this. Okay. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second on the table, so we need to vote on this issue. And the resolution is passed. And next on the agenda is the internal audit activity briefing. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Chair, Mr. Parker, members of the MARTA board, um, today my uh, audit activity briefing will consist of uh, two components. The first one will be a briefing or uh, uh, an expose on the role of MARTA's internal audit 
in the cyber assurance uh, process here at MARTA. And the second component will be the customary quarterly activity briefing, which I provide every three months. Over the last couple of years, we have witnessed a number of severe and high-profile cybersecurity breaches in the country and also globally. We also uh, personally experienced the uh, uh, impact and the outcome of the Colonial Pipeline, which is based here in Atlanta, of their cybersecurity breach a couple of months ago. There have been a number since then. Uh, this compelled me to come here to the board and really explain what the audit department here at MARTA has been doing and the activities we have been taking and our go forward strategy as it relates to cybersecurity assurance as this is becoming and will continue to be a very hot topic going forward. Next slide, please. For the purposes of the presentation uh, and the activities that I orchestrate, I have chosen the three lines of defense model which is commonly accepted in the world of risk management, governance, risk, and, and compliance. In that three lines of defense model, the first line of defense are the operational business units and the IT functions. They're the front line, and they're the ones that kind of meet uh, often with uh, attempts of uh, cyber intrusion, uh, social engineering, etc. In the three lines of defense model, that first line of defense is responsible for executing cyber risk mitigation, escalating risk exposure as it relates to uh, cybersecurity, and also um, embedding cybersecurity in everyday decision making. And I will give a simple example of those to make it real. For example, the IT function is responsible for implementing firewalls to protect the authority. All the business unit functions, such as my functions, I'm responsible to make sure that all of my employees have taken the mandatory cyber risk training that Dean is providing every year, uh, and do some other things as it relates to uh, cyber security protection for my particular group. I'll give you another example. When we secured or when we procured our audit software, it was my responsibility to work with Kirk and his people to make sure that this audit software that we selected has the appropriate protections from cybersecurity uh, from cybersecurity point of view. So first line of defense. The second line of defense is the Office of Information Security here at MARTA, and Dean will be speaking here later today a little bit more in detail. But the job of the second line of defense is to set policies and standards to select or help implement cybersecurity protection tools and processes and also to provide oversight, consultation, and periodic updates to the board on the cybersecurity protection activities at MARTA. Where we come into play, the Department of Internal Audit is the third line of defense. Our job is to provide independent and objective review of the cybersecurity program effectiveness, to provide independent confirmation to the board and MARTA's executive of the cybersecurity and cyber risk management inside the authority, and also uh, to verify regulatory compliance, which as of today is pretty light from the FTA, but I fully expect that in the years to come, we will be subjective to uh, subjected to much more rigorous regulatory requirements from the federal government. Those requirements exist already in areas such as financial services or energy generation, uh, etc. Uh, even healthcare is subject to much more stringent uh, regulatory requirements. You know, based on my research and based on what's going on at the federal government, I do expect that um, in the future we'll see much more stringent regulatory compliance requirements also on transit. Uh, and I believe we're well prepared to respond and to provide the board with the assurance the board needs as it relates to the MARTA a degree of compliance with those uh, regulatory requirements in the future. All of this takes place under the watchful eye of the audit committee and the executive management team. In fact, beginning in November of 2017, uh, the MARTA audit committee began to receive periodic and regular updates from the Office of Information Security and Dean Malice on what we do as an authority to protect ourselves against cyber intrusion. 
We don't do that every quarter, but I believe we do it at a minimum of two to three times a year. I must say that uh, from a governance and from a board perspective, this is one of the best practices that's out there in the world of corporate uh, and organizational governance to where the audit committee uh, receives regular updates on the status of the uh, cybersecurity protections at a particular organization. Next slide, please. What do we do as an internal organization, uh, audit organization, uh, as it relates to cyber assurance? My strategy and my approach is based on what I call the three C's approach. The three C stands for competent, comprehensive, and collaborative. Within my department, the Department of Internal Audit, I have two senior auditors, two senior IT auditors, and I have a uh, manager of IT audits position, which is currently vacant, and I'm source sourcing for it. The two senior IT auditors have a number of certification and significant experience in IT and cybersecurity auditing. They have certified information system auditor certification. They have a certification of um, certified data protection security engineer. And last but not least, they have certificates from the Rochester Institute of Technology in cybersecurity fundamentals. I have spent a number of hours myself at Georgia Tech getting certified in cybersecurity because I do believe that to be a very important uh, part of my job. Hey, this in it can, can I interrupt just a minute? I want to ask, this is a question, I, I, we talked a little bit about it the other day, but I think, uh, are, are we leaving, are you going from an audit perspective of what's going on to a uh, involvement in what's decided about how to deal with cybersecurity. Is there a is there a change underway? And this may be a Jeff question as much as anything else but about the role that the audit department plays in decisions about how to deal with cybersecurity. And and maybe I'm out of place in even well, bringing this up. Right it now. came to the board a couple years ago, and we made the decision that cybersecurity fell under audit. It was a board decision. F falling under f falling under the audit committee. Mm -hmm. from a board perspective, but in terms of managing um, cyber risk, you know, there were, you, you presented three levels of, of um, protection you could back, you could back up. Slide. And so the first being the operating unit, first line of defense, the business unit, second, Dean, and he'll be up here in a minute, and, and his, his primary responsibility as sort of the internal owner of cybersecurity. Obviously, it all starts with the business units. And then, and then from an audit perspective, that third line of defense is really, really that independent um, view of are we following regulatory um, and our own practices and policies. And right now, the state of the art is most of, most if not all, is set by our own policies. There are not, there's not much, if any, regulatory requirements put upon us. Um, and as Dean said a minute ago, that's coming. We believe it's coming. It, it really flipped overnight for the pipeline industry after the, the colonial attack. So we suspect it will come um, very quickly when it comes. But, but, you know, if you, think of, if you think of the audit responsibility, an auditor needs to be independent of the management actions, and their job needs to be to make sure that we are following, as an organization, our own policy standards and then any sort of regulatory. So the decision-making in terms of what we really need to do, you know, irrespective of, of the audit group's knowledge base, they really need to be independent and look at what we've committed to do and measure us against that. Is that, that fair? I think that's very fair and um, I have to be careful what I say because the government auditing standards are very, very, very prescriptive about our inability to participate in decision making as it relates to any operational decision making. So we should not be doing that. But we do ask a lot of questions in the process of making those decisions, which hopefully make those decisions better informed decisions. Well, it seems to me, Jeff, it's a very tedious management issue yeah. that you're talking about here yeah. that, it, that I'm asking about. But, and, and while I understand the cybersecurity may 
fall under the audit. It really doesn't. It's a well, it falls under the audit committee, right, from a board's perspective. So, I, so, okay. so let's distinguish between, between the board's uh, fiduciary and, and, resp and policy responsibility that the board in, very appropriately has said it needs to fall under the audit committee. Right, so we're, we're reporting information, in this case, both audit information where, where our audit group has an audit responsibility for cybersecurity, as well as Dean's responsibility, and I'll call it the operational responsibility for cybersecurity, the implementation side. I mean, I'll make an, a very simple analogy. Um, we, we have a very clear role in our mind because that's where auditors sort of, the, the world of auditing, you know, fits very nicely. Raj is our CFO. Um, Emil leads our audit group, right? There's a very clear kind of mental understanding of roles and responsibilities between a CFO and, a, and an internal auditor, and the same relationship exists between Dean and Emil around cybersecurity, so. Okay, thank you. And if I might add, I recently read a research that out of the Fortune 100 companies, 67% of them have assigned the audit committee to oversee the cybersecurity activities of those 100 corporations. And according to ENY, that's one of the best practices out there in corporate governance. That's uh, as of 2020, the end of 2020. Uh, if we can go back to the next slide. Uh, no, go to the previous slide. There you go. Um, we need to be very competent in the internal audit department in order to enable the second bullet point uh, being comprehensive. Uh, and being comprehensive means a number of things, and I've highlighted three of them. One of them is anchoring our internal audit plan in, in two uh, separate but related standards. The first one is the Center for Internet Security. They have 18 groups of controls, and we kind of map our internal audit plan to those 18. Secondly, and it's equally important, is the National Institute of Standard Act Technology, NIST. They have the 853 framework, which is mandated in all federal information systems, which means in simple terms, any federal agencies has to comply with NIST 853. Uh, I do expect in the future that to be made mandatory in bigger group of or, or broader set of organizations, but MARTA follows NIST as well. Um, 853 has over 1,000 information security controls and data privacy controls. It's a very comprehensive framework. Many of our audit programs are informed or, um, you know, based on NIST 853, and I'll give you an example on the next page just to kind of keep it real. The next element of the comprehensiveness is covering both our enterprise environment, things like laptops, desktop servers, emails, and our industrial control systems environment, which is our train control and related communication systems, which are very, very different in terms of technology, architecture, and cybersecurity design elements uh, uh, and protection compared to our enterprise system. And thirdly, shifting the emphasis of our cybersecurity audits from kind of broad and generic to more deep level auditing. Um, I'm personally convinced that Colonial's uh, pipeline uh, did have uh, policies, they did have procedures. I'm convinced that Equifax, when they got breached a couple of years ago, they did have policies, they did have procedures. It's not just about policies and procedures. We have to go down deep into the trenches and audit a lot of the technical elements of our cybersecurity protection. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that on the next slide. The last one is collaborative. Um, I have seen organizations talk to other CAEs where there is quite a bit of animosity between a CAE, chief audit executive, and a head of IT or head of cybersecurity. That is not the best approach as it comes to cybersecurity auditing or any auditing for that matter. We must remain, and we have been very collaborative with Dean Malice, who is our Chief of Information Security, and Kirk Talbot, who is our Chief of IT. Um, this is very, very important because on one, ha one hand, we have to keep them honest. And that's our big role is we have to keep those two organizations honest. We have to be independent and we have to do, we have to see if they do what they're supposed to do. But at, at the same time, 
you know, we need to uh, create an environment of continuous improvement and open and honest discussion both ways. Uh, and to me, that's been part of my strategy and my relationship with those two gentlemen. Secondly, is very rigorously following up on remediation of audit findings from prior audits. Uh, that's the only way we can achieve continuous improvement in the organization. And thirdly, really benchmark and go out and, and, and talk to other organizations to adopt best practices, uh, both from a corporate world and from the world of public sector. This is a very, very new um, area for many, many organizations. The world of cybersecurity and cybersecurity auditing is evolving continuously. Um, and we need to be at that forefront, at the top of the wave, to be able to benchmark against the best in class. And I will go to the next slide, please, um, and just remind the audit committee of our six IT audits for uh, this fiscal year. They have a very strong uh, cybersecurity flavor. And I will pick on the password management audit to illustrate what I call deep level auditing. You know, this is, a, this is an audit that will focus on our, you know, Windows passwords, if you will, just to kind of simplify it a little bit, but not just focusing on whether we have policies and procedures in place. We want to examine our technical controls. Is the system allowing easy to guess passwords? For example, does the system allow an employee to set up a password such as Marta123, or January 2022, or July 2021? you know, things of that nature will go down into the configuration of that enforcement and, and really kind of go into the technical side of the enforcement of those password controls. And we will base that audit on NIST 853, which has a list of things that an organization needs to have in order to have reasonably good password controls. So this is just an example of what I call kind of deeper level auditing, not just do you have policies and procedures, but are those policies and procedures systematically enforced? Um, so again, we're moving more and more towards cybersecurity flavor type audits um, uh, because the risk is really out there and it will all, all only continue to increase in, in the next couple of years, in my opinion. So with that said, um, I would uh, switch over to the second component of my briefing, which is the regular quarterly briefing for Q4 of fiscal year 21. During that period of time, the operational audit group issued four audit reports. The first two were compliance audits. Um, uh, SOC 1, which reviews the internal controls of a number of very large service providers that are providing services to MARTA. An example of that is Bank of America, which provides a lot of our banking services. We reviewed their SOC 1 report, make sure they have a clean SOC 1 report. We review the SOC 1 report of our healthcare providers, for example, et cetera, et cetera. The second one was a compliance uh, report of our police uh, department. Every year, year we provide a service to the police department and we look at their controls and their performance as it relates to their um, uh, control of the high risk and high value items in their property and evidence room. These are items such as weapons, drugs, cash, jewelry, et cetera, et cetera. This audit is required under the CALEA certification of the MARTA Police Department, so it enables the annual CALEA certification of the Police Department. The third audit was a uh, advisory audit for the Department of Finance, and the fourth one was a performance or operational audit that looked at our COVID-19 expenditures. You know, we did not see, based on our sampling techniques, we did not see anything uh, inappropriate there, but we identified one opportunity for improvement which we documented. Next slide, please. From prior periods, we continue to track uh, items that are still in the process of being remediated. There is one past due item that we are highlighting here, which is from a audit done several years ago, uh, which is still past due. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, it will be remediated soon. And then a large number of items are becoming due in August. Uh, they are coming out of the Capital Improvement Program audit, which we completed earlier in 2021. Um, so uh, overall, 32 uh, findings, uh, of which uh, 21 were closed uh, from the significant findings, 10 are in process, and one is past due. If we switch to the next slide, the next slide is the Information Technology Audit Group. 
Uh, we issued two uh, draft audit reports. We have since uh, finalized the first one, but at the end of June, they were in draft status. Software patch management audit, very important from a cybersecurity perspective. What patch management refers to is the, is the installation of security updates on various different uh, pieces of software and hardware within the authority. Um, we will issue this report this month and we'll report the exact number and nature of those fin findings at the November audit committee meeting. We did one advisory report on the MARTA CCTV uh, storage uh, capacity for the Department of Police Services um, and we've uh, had some um, you know, insights that we share with the police uh, department as a result of that audit and we'll be sharing those with the IT department as well. Uh, can you please move to the next slide? From prior um, periods, we're tracking um, 11 total significant findings, five were closed, four still in progress. Um, of the two past due findings, one is pretty technical. Uh, the first one, which is not all end user devices on the modern network were centrally managed. We have received information, we're confirming that indeed this issue can be closed. The second item, which is the devices that are running unsupported software, the number of those devices, and I won't go into too much detail, but the number of those devices has been reduced since the last time I reported to the audit committee, but there are still some devices out on the network, and we'll continue to monitor the progress on that issue. Um, I'm working with Dean. In fact, Dean and I are meeting every week on a number of different cybersecurity topics. We have at least a, a, a one weekly meeting to discuss various different elements of cybersecurity uh, and cybersecurity issues just in general and here in the authority. We're continuing to monitor this. Some progress has been made uh, and um, hopefully we'll make more progress uh, in the coming months. Next slide, please. The contract audit group issued 14 audits. They identified 357,000 in uh, unallowable cost in overhead rate reviews and 69,000 in potential cost savings in cost price analysis. At the end of June, we had 15 audits in progress. As a reminder, this is an ongoing pipeline. We handle those audits as we receive them, so there's no specific audit plan. We just, it's a throughput kind of a process. Next slide, please. For the entire year, fiscal 21, we issued 53 contract audits, which identified $1.6 million in um, unallowable cost in overhead rate reviews and $3.8 million in potential cost savings in cost price analysis or change order reviews. Overall, a good year for the department. We issued seven performance audit engagements and 10 advisory audit engagements. Of those advisory, 10 advisory audit engagements, most of them were related to COVID-19 risk protection elements. Um, as a reminder, we had audits related to how frequently we clean the TVMs, the, the, the ticket vending machines, the high touch surfaces, how frequently and whether we change the bus um, uh, air filters, the filters in the rail cars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, the last audit I will mention is the MARTOC management audit, which was completed by KPMG and delivered to the MARTOC committee at the end of December, according to the MARTA Act. Uh, the audit was executed by KPMG, was supervised by the Department of Internal Audit, um, and it was done, uh, again, to the satisfaction of MARTOC and according to the MARTA Act. Next slide. The fraud, waste, and abuse line uh, received eight calls, and I will summarize by saying that none of the eight calls were related directly to fraud, waste, or abuse. They, uh, the, the calls were routed to the respective MARTA department for additional follow-up and uh, resolution. I do expect as we bring our employees back to the office, the hotline to begin to be a little bit busier, uh, but we'll deal with that uh, when, when this comes. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this concludes my presentation and the briefing. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments about this briefing? <coughs> Mr. No, Pond. Uh, Emil, uh, uh, great compliments uh, to Dean and yourself and your group. I know with Jeff's help with the budget, uh, you've placed a much stronger focus on cybersecurity, and I've seen it from two or three years ago, and I 
you guys are, are doing all the right things. The sad part about cybersecurity is, is you never know until it's too late, but uh, it's a very complex arena. My quick question is, is on these penetration tests where you hire outside consultants to come in and try to get into your system, I'd be curious uh, uh, how much that is uh, being done and, and just give us an example of the kind of things they have done and the corrective action that you've taken. Have you got any specific examples to share? Um, so so let, let me walk you through the process. So the, the two penetration tests that we've had of the uh, enterprise env environment and the uh, train control network were, uh, as you said, uh, performed by external specialized firms. Uh, they have been orchestrated and, uh, and administered by Dean Malice and his team, and they have provided oversight over it. I have personally read both of those reports and received direct briefings from the external consultants performing those penetration tests, and I've had the opportunity to ask direct questions without any filtering by Dean and his people. So I have to thank him for being completely and totally transparent. Um, those penetration tests have identified a number of areas for remediation and improvement. Um, I'm very hesitant to provide examples because we're on YouTube. Um, so what I would say though is we have on the audit plan an audit that will follow up and review if those deficiencies have been fixed. Those were the two audits in the middle of the audit plan on the slide. So after we're done with those audits, because I have the spreadsheets and action item by action item of what had to be done we will be in a good position to come to the audit committee and provide an update in order to say, are those things remediated or not? Um, again, given the public forum, I'm, I'm very, very nervous about providing specific examples because some of those things just can be used by a malicious party to harm the authority. No, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or concerns? <laughs> Mr. Abdul Salam? Thank you. Uh, Emil, back on slide two, um, well, first of all, thank you for an excellent presentation, very thorough. Um, on slide two, it, in the corner, in the gray boxes, uh, it talks about uh, escalate risks outside of acceptable risk tolerance. Who would you escalate to, if you can say? Uh, the escalation about? point here should be Dean Malice. Okay. Um, so as it relates to cybersecurity, the escalation point is and should continue to be Dean Malice, okay. uh, and then he will um, manage it appropriately. Thank you. Um, so. Any other questions? Thank you for that great briefing. And now, without further ado, I think we get to meet and talk. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And Scott, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Just to piggyback on Ms. Abdul Salam's question, what is the threshold for acceptable risk tolerance? I think that will depend very much on the individual circumstances and the individual system and, and the risk that's um, involved in it. Uh, there, there's typically no dollar threshold. There's no number to the risk tolerance, but um, based on their judgment and my judgment, we might be uh, much less tolerant to, uh, for example, our internet web page and our systems that are facing the internet. We might be more um, uh, willing to accept risks to some internal system that's protected behind a firewall with separate usernames and passwords and things of that nature. So it's a bit of a judgment call as it relates to uh, myself, Dean, or the AGM. And I'll give you a hypothetical example. If there is some sort of a risk that will um, disrupt our revenue, for example. Let's say there is a risk hypothetically uh, in theory of, uh, of um, our uh, cubic system being disrupted. That would be an unacceptable level of risk, right? If the operations can ground to a halt, that would not be an acceptable level of risk. Um, so th th that might be an example of what is acceptable versus unacceptable. Thank you. Anyone else? Now, without further ado, let's meet Mr. Dean Malice. Thank you. <laughs> We've heard a lot about you this morning. 
Good to see you again, Dean. person the whole zoom thing i'm done with so it's great to see everybody it's good to see uh, you as Chair, well mr parker um, marta board um, my name is dean mouse i'm the agm of information security or the CISO, and i'm going to give you kind of a brief briefing on things that we've done i briefed uh, last month gave that presentation kind of where we started and, and where we're at today so i'm just going to kind of go through some of the things that we've implemented over the last uh since i last presented next slide please <coughs> Kind of a busy slide, so um, upcoming procurement initiatives, we've already deployed what is called, and I'm not going to get too technical, malicious domain blocking. Basically, it's a service that checks all of our outbound traffic, make sure those, those destinations are not, are not malicious. The paid version, we get that free through Department of Homeland Security. I'm a big proponent of using whatever we can get from the feds for free because it helps MARTA and it's not a, a, a hit to our bottom line. So that service, the paid version, allows me then to start encrypting, uh, looking at encrypted traffic, because a lot of the hackers like to encrypt data before they send it out. It allows us to set a block list of our own, stop people from going to sites that we've deemed uh, inappropriate or, or, or bad sites. So it's a very uh, low cost. It's about $50,000 for that service for the year. We get the free portion. We've had it for a year, and we're going to continue that, and this just kind of adds to it. One of the other initiatives right now that we're doing, it's an application called CrowdStrike, and it's advanced endpoint protection. Um, the endpoint protection that we have now is antiquated, it's old, it uses um, what they call signatures. A virus or a malware has to be known for them to be able to write signatures to block it. CrowdStrike works a little bit differently. It looks for anomalous behavior on the systems. It looks for um, things getting spun up that shouldn't happen. There, there are certain behaviors that should not happen. Mr. Parker, I'll pick on Mr. Parker. His machine should not be talking to my machine or vice versa. They should go to servers. So if that happens, this, this application says, well, we're going to block that. That should not be happening. So we're doing a proof of value right now. We've rolled it out to about 85, 90% of the authority, testing its capabilities. It's a very fine product. Uh, after we procure it, it'll be at 100%. One of the other things that it does is it allows the vendor to do kind of what they call threat hunting. It takes all that data that it's getting from those endpoints, and it looks for things that maybe the endpoint didn't get. Did I log in from here and then also try and log in from Russia in, in a matter of time? It's physically impossible. So it's a very good product. It sits at the top of the list in the industry of quality products for advanced endpoint. The other thing that I'm looking at is a 24 by 7 monitoring, a true 24 by 7 monitoring vendor that can take that CrowdStrike data, can take our log data, aggregate it into a system, a log aggregator, which we have, and then monitor that 24 by 7 so that we can then re respond to those after hours. Right now we're really kind of a, a you know, at 8, 7 in the morning to a 6 at night type of shop. We'll get some alerts that sometimes I'm fortunate that I have a team that is even though uh, a lot of contractors are very engaged in the process and they'll look at stuff after hours, we don't pay them for that, but that's just how dedicated they are. This will give that true 24 by 7 monitoring of the environment so that we can get alerting on any anomalous events. Hackers don't sleep, they don't take vacation, so we've got to make sure that we're doing these things on a continuous basis. Um, I also want to outsource the vulnerability scanning, so Emil talked about patches. Well, we have a scanner that scans the environment and says you're missing these security updates. It takes me a, a, about a half an FTE to do that type of work, and there's a lot that goes into configuring those. An outside vendor, I can do it cheaper. I'm always looking to save the authority money on things that would make sense to outsource out of the authority. So it's save on an FTE, FTE it would also they provide the vulnerability scanner, so it's a cost that I won't have to incur to the authority. <coughs> Excuse me. Multi-factor authentication. So we're about 99% complete. For those that don't know what that is, when a lot of banks are using that now, if you're going to sign into your bank, you've got to get a text to your phone to enter, enter in an extra code. That's what we've deployed out to 99% of the authority for um, all the office products right now. The next thing that we're working on is all the privilege account. Privilege account, Kirk's teams, uh, are, they have accounts that are elevated. They have more privileges within the authority. Doing multi-factor on those is important because those accounts should only be used for specific work. They shouldn't be used on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
forcing that really kind of changes behavior and also makes sure that those privileged accounts continually have to be challenged so that code could be um, entered in. The antivirus replacement, CrowdStrike is taking that, anti, uh, is taking the replace, uh, replacement, replacing that, and um, we've also procured Windows Defender, which is a Microsoft product. It's part of that big procurement that we did uh, last month for all the Microsoft licensing. What that does is it gives us a layered defense. So if somebody gets past the CrowdStrike, they got to get past the Windows Defender as well. It's a best practice in the industry that you have layers of defenses in your network because one, if one gets breached, they still got to go through another. MTA had a breach, I think it was in May, and because of their, they have a very mature program there, and because of their layered defenses that they have, it, the impact to their authority was, was minimal. Cost them some money to remediate it, but the hackers didn't get any of that data. I believe that is the last slide. A few other items I wanted to touch on. One of the things that we're doing, uh, working with a vendor now to do a uh, tabletop exercise, which is very important to test your, the incident response, a resiliency. So I'm working with Kirk's team on this tabletop to see that we can recover. Recovery is important. You know, I can put in all the protections and you can uh, authorize a lot of money to do those protections, but I mentioned in our last briefing that they only have to be right once. Can we recover once that happens? So we, we're doing that table to top to kind of see if we, we're capable of that, that um, being able to recover. The, uh, Mr. Parker and, and Finance approved uh, 11 FTEs total for my department this year in FY22. Uh, right now we've got four, including me, that we've, we've brought in. We've got two offers going out for engineers this week. We've got two more interviews happening next week. I'm slowly phasing out my contractors because it costs the authority too much money. Um, and I'm hoping to have all those positions filled within this, this quarter here. And the last thing that I, that I want to share is over the years we've been able to acquire uh, federal grants for cybersecurity. We just got... Um, and it's shared between us and, and police a $1.9 $1 uh, million dollar grant from uh, DHS. Part of that's going to be for cybersecurity. I don't have the breakdown yet, but it's a way for us to not spend the money. We get that reimbursement from, from the feds. And over the years, that would be a total for cybersecurity of about $3.8 million. Next slide. I believe that concludes my presentation, and it does. Do we have some questions for our comments for Dean? Mr. Floyd? Are there things that you are not doing because you have not been given the funds to do it with? Um, no. I mean, there's things that, that uh, I've been fortunate in that Mr. Parker and, and Raj has seen the importance over the years and even his predecessor of cybersecurity have gotten uh, a considerable amount. It's, it's the implementation that takes time. So one of the things that the grant does for us is it allows me, there's, there's things that Kirk's team needs, like uh, I'll give them switches and routers. We have, we're, some of them are old, right? Their budget is tight. I've got some dollars. Um, I have to say honestly that I've, the, the support that I've received from the board and from Mr. Parker in terms of, of monies uh, allocated, I have not wanted for anything. A lot of it is just implementation and timing on things. Um, I will tell you this is I'm, I'm pretty transparent and to me there are things that you know there's risks right and we have to be transparent about those risks and Mr. Parker knows this that the, I'm not one to say oh you know they've been great if they're not because the board needs to understand where our risks are it might be a career limiting move for me, but you know, at the end of the day, if you do the right thing for the authority, you're doing the right thing for the authority. I have a question, Dean. Yes. I know you sit on a lot of the APTA committees as we discuss cybersecurity. How do you think we fit in the big scheme of things with our other competitors um, out there, or not competitors, our other um, Trans transit agencies out there? Yes. So there are some that are more mature, um, WMATA. He has about 70 people working in cybersecurity. They got about a $30 million budget. Uh, MTA is very mature. They've had, their programs have been around longer. Uh, talking with Kyle at WMATA, um, 
his opinion is that there's a lot of agencies that are not. And I, I've gone back through some emails from 2018 because we did a survey among our transit uh, partners. What is your investment in cybersecurity? How many people do you have? From a, I, I really honestly have to say that I think we've got a, a more mature program than most. We have a long way to go because we're still relatively new. Um, and, you know, in the beginning was a rough road, as, as most of you know, moving this program forward. And with the support that I've had over the past two years, it's, it's, it's moving it forward at, at a pretty good pace, but it takes time. Um, long answer. Compared to WMATAs and, and MTAs, we're extremely mature. Uh, compared to some of the ones on the West Coast, we're, we're a lot more mature. Um, right now what we're doing, and I think I mentioned it in my briefing, is all of us have gotten together to kind of mandate for the vendors that there's a minimum cybersecurity that needs to be implemented in their products because they'll send us products that, that have vulnerabilities in it. And we've come together as a, as a whole, so it's not just Dean saying, oh, just let's out pick on Stadl, you need to do this. It's all of us in North America saying, this is what we expect. And it's something that we're working on. Don't know if it'll work, but we figure it's better with bigger numbers to, to drive things forward. Sorry. Dean, could, could I just ask you to talk about, we, we, we ran into each other this morning, um, the, the three calls that, we, that you and I have set up with, the, uh, yeah. with some of our peers to, to really answer that, that question a little bit. And then, um, and then the, I do want to mention the, the Mineta um, study that, that you had had, and that sort of takes a snapshot of, of where the transit industry is relative to uh, cybersecurity. And I think when you compare us to the statistics in there, we're, you know, we're on the right side of, of the average by far. Um, so talk, talk about the meetings that, that we're going to have shortly. Yeah, uh, and, and just, just on that point, we are, I mean, Emil mentioned uh, NIST and, and the CIS. That, that's the framework we're following. So we're, we're following NIST and we're following the CIS as we implement the, these controls in place. And, you know, looking across, we, we're, we've got a formal program. And I think that is really important because the, the feds are going to come down and, and almost guarantee you they're going to say you're going to have to follow NIST because it's already in the federal program. So we're ahead of that game uh, on that side. So I've set up, or in the process of setting up, um, Mr. Park and I, speaking with my CISO counterparts, I picked the, really the mature organizations, the MTA, the WMATA, and the New Jersey Transit, so that we can speak to them about things that they have done, are we on the right track, what sort of audits, well, I won't use audit, but what sort of risk assessments have they done, how did that help them, where do they see their deficiencies, you know, are we moving down the right path? I actually, some of my peers in the, in the private sector thinks I'm nuts, be, well, I am, but think I'm nuts because I, I really work tight with internal audit because it's important that they've got that outside um, look to say, you know, you kind of get blinders on sometimes and you're looking down this path and audit will come and say, hey, you know, we did this audit and you, are you looking over here? I think it's really good. So these uh, discussions that we're gonna have you get it from a mature organization, so you look at the WMATAs with 70 people and the MTA, I think uh, Tariq's got about 60 people. Where four FTEs and five or six contractors, a lot smaller organization, so why reinvent the wheel when you've got these other organizations that have done it, that have these mature programs, and we can kind of get a sense of where we're gonna be going and the best way to go. So when I was talking to Kyle over at WMATA, talking about the risk management framework, which I've mentioned to, to the board before in terms of the framework that we're using. He was, it was great um, intelligence from him about how he tried to implement it when he was at the FBI and the mistakes that he made over there and what he's doing at WMATA, not duplicating those mistakes. Like I said, I'm, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If, now I know, okay, this is, this is not the path we want to go down. I'll move down that path because it's an easier, smoother, an easier implementation on that path. And, and then let me let me just add one more thing that that I think we're we're focusing on. And this may be more of an industry issue. Is that is that I think as an industry, um, you know, most agencies have folks like Dean, and and managing a cyber program. But I think as an industry where we need to get better 
and be prepared for the eventual oversight that is just that is just one hack away from being unloaded by the FTA on you know and TSA on the transit industry is that elevating that conversation to the to the CEO level and the board level. So I think we need to not only think about resources for Dean, but are we having policy conversations at a higher level about the importance of this stuff? And I think, you know, we've got a very, very mature um, organization around having good, good, you know, thoughtful conversations at a policy level with the board and, and, at, and at my level. And so we're having, um, uh, you know, I've reached out to APTA when I was reading uh, two things. When I was reading about what happened to the pipeline industry, like literally overnight um, in terms of oversight. And then the other piece of it was that Secretary Buttigieg made sort of a, more of an off the hand comment about that, there, that, that he doesn't want a transportation infrastructure project not to include an element of cybersecurity in that. And so, and so, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with APTA to convene a CEO uh, workshop where we're really trying to make sure as an industry we're raising our um, awareness and the discussion at the leaders level. Because I think, quite frankly, irrespective of how good Dean Malice is doing at MARTA, if, if we can't convince um, the FTA, TSA, that from a at an industry level that boards and CEOs are paying attention to this stuff, if they don't believe us at that level, it's really sort of irrelevant what Dean's doing because their perception is, well, Dean, Dean can be the smartest guy in the world at, at, at MARTA. He can have all the plans in the world, but if nobody's listening to him, it's, you know, it's, it's not important. So I think, you know, so, so, so we're really trying to get, you know, um, the industry to kind of step up a little more and, and, and be able to articulate the good things that are going on around the industry because I think that's an important piece too because we're, we're literally on the verge of having, yeah. you know, federal oversight around this issue. I will say that that is a really important point, Mr. Parker, is the support from the board and from the leadership. Um, you look at Equifax, the support from the board happened after the breach. That is not the time for, for support to happen. I'm very fortunate in my role that I do have the support, and especially Mr. Pond, when he was on audit committee earlier, really kind of driving this forward, and, and, and Emil and, and Mr. Parkham showing the importance, because without the top-down support, it makes this job a lot more difficult, because trying to push it from the bottom up is, is hard. So I, I really have to commend the board for their engagement and bringing this to the forefront. Mr. Parker bringing this to the forefront and showing that, that cybersecurity really is important to get in the agency in the right place. We're here to keep business moving in the most efficient and secure manner that we can. Thank you. And for those of you, I know we have new board members and different staggering terms on here, but our first, I guess, real scare was um, several years ago when the city of Atlanta was hacked. And at that point, we did have some interfaces that we immediately cut off. And that's when this discussion really started at a much higher level because it was our first, I guess, real scare. Am I right? I think that's, yeah. as I remember, the one that scared us the most. And since then, we've continued to move forward and get to the point we are today. So I want to commend everybody for all the great work that's happened because it's great that and, we're where we are. And that's the importance is that we can show that we've moved forward and that we're doing these things because the... The lens that we're viewed at, if something should happen, is going to be different than the lens we're seeing that we see it through, right? So mm -hmm. you got to make sure yeah. you're doing that due diligence as best as you can so that when, I don't want to say when, if it should happen, um, they can say, well, you, you kind of did really everything you could. Um, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's the important point. We talked a lot about things that we're doing um, in, from a policy level, from an execution <laughs> level, but let's not... I mean, even how, whatever we do, this, pro, this presents a tremendous area of risk for, for MARTA, for, you know, uh, for, the, for the industry. So, so I don't want anyone to walk away from this feeling like 
you know, we have this confidence that we're, we've immuned ourselves from any sort of cyber attack. It's a, it's a tremendous risk that, that we face like every other public and private company in, in the world, so. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a excellent point because it's, we're not. There's a lot of work that we still have to do, but having the support is, is making it easier for me. Any other comments, well, Mr. I'd Floyd? I only offer my support, and Dean, it's incredible to hear you talk about how much how important it is for you to talk to your peers around the country. I don't think, I think that's one of the biggest things is to, I mean, you, you could spend 125% of your time here doing your job, but if you don't spend some of your time going around the country talking to people about what they're doing, what they're thinking, what their problems are, and them learning how you're dealing with it here, that's a big part, not just in cybersecurity, but in anything MARTA does. It's a big part of doing it. You have to allow some time to hear what's going on in the rest of the country and the world with this in order to make sure what we do here is the best practices. So I'm fortunate in the, in the relationships I've built and I'm working to build more across really the transit. I come from the private sector initially, so I've got a lot of uh, contacts there. Um, Jamil at Equifax is a C, uh, CISO for Equifax. I can text him really any time of the day asking him a question. It's that give and take and that interaction. The other thing that I make sure that I do is I sit on the board of an organization called InfraGuard, which is an FBI uh, civilian alliance. And that is really focused around cybersecurity and attacks against the, the um, infrastructure. So I get a lot of, of feedback through there and through my peers that are on there because they're in different industries as well, as well as through the FBI. And one of the things that being at MARTA has afforded is secret clearance so I can get some other intel from the feds that my, some of my peers cannot get. But you hit that point, you, this is not a vacuum and we're trying to share more information so that we can kind of holistically do best practices in the industry. Um, I, I sit in on a couple of other boards with CISOs and go to conferences in the evening just to exchange those ideas. It's, it's really important. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? If not, this has been a great meeting. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.